cheers to breaking the ice with us and for having us. This is uh, your normal you. go-to coffee. Yeah, I mean, this is my drink, caffeine. I mean, it's the writer's drink. Yeah. Especially if I, I'm not a great sleeper, so this is my liquid sleep each morning before I get going, before I get writing. Okay. I read, I read once that, one of the, that some of the common denominators for writers are long walks and coffee. Those are for, for good productive writers. Take long walks and drink coffee. Interesting. So I need to get back to my walks, but I have the coffee. Oh, cheers to that. Cheers. Oh, that's good coffee. Yeah. At what age did you realize you wanted to be a screenplay writer? Screenwriting for me is a, is a challenge. And, uh, and I sort of feel like my relationship to screenwriting is, is about the challenge. And it's about trying to crack something that is difficult to crack. It's about trying to figure out something uh, that I struggle to figure out and um, you know whether that's the story itself or the characters or trying to figure out a way into a true story to you know make it entertaining enough to earn a spot in a theater it's like a puzzle mm. and it drives me nuts and I you know I love it like a puzzle uh, but it's not like it's some delicious thing that I just dreamed of doing my entire life mm. and so we'll see we'll see where my life and my career go it was this uh, step that I took because you didn't have to be rich to be a screenwriter. Yeah, you just needed, sure. a, you know, a pen and paper or a creative a, or a laptop. Mind. So I don't know. I haven't decided what I want to be when I grow up, <laughs> or if I'm ever going to grow up. I haven't I, decided I, I yet. Not quite that, yet. I think that's awesome. Yeah. Um, well, anyone who's successful has gone through some challenges in life: <clears throat> setbacks, failures, rejection. I mean, how did you get to where you are now? Being like in the military, Mormon, Southern in America, which is very conservative. A Republican home. I mean, sure. it wasn't exactly the most, particularly in the er in that era. So it's like we're eighties into the nineties. It's like it was not a, an accepting, not even a tolerant place to be gay. And you know, I think like most or many you know LGBT people, I knew I had an awareness of who I was, what I was. I knew the crushes that I had were not on the girls. I, the girls were all my best friends, and the, and the boys were you know, caught my heart. And so I also had words for that. Because if you live in a place that's that conservative, you're probably hearing some pretty rough language mm. around being an LGBT person. So because I had words for it, there was no confusion about who I was and what I was. There was also no confusion about what I would face if anyone found out. Mm. So you, you know, even at the time, it was still a, a crime. Uh, it was many still considered a mental illness and would want to put you into conversion therapy, which could include uh, electroshock therapy or just the more quote unquote traditional and now increasingly outlawed conversion therapy. So you knew that would happen. Um, but you also knew that beyond the law and medicine, you were probably going to be a pariah in your community, mm. an outlaw <laughs> with your church. Uh, and our church in the South is the center of community. So like, you're just, you're left out of everything. Then you also don't want to lose your parents' love and your yeah. family's love. So you really struggle, you know, I mean, it puts you into a closet um, that's very dark, it's very dim, and you're not quite aware, uh, particularly at that time and in that place, that there are other people like you. Mm. And so you're just looking for a way out. And, you know, unfortunately, the way out for a lot of young people still is uh, to take their own lives. Mm. And I have just dedicated so much of my work uh, to making sure there's other avenues besides that. And one of the ways you can help is just to let those kids know out there you're not alone. That there are a lot of other people like you out there um, and that they've been around, LGBT people have been around forever. And some of them have actually been fighting to make sure your life is going to be better. And that just that that message to me is so hopeful mm -hmm. that hopefully it's helpful to some of those young people out there, and I, I, it's got to be helpful to see, you know, when I when I first knew I was gay, there was nothing on TV or film. There's no real easily accessible like images of ourselves, stories of who we were. Now increasingly, there's tons. Mm -hmm. It's really, and we're starting to get not just the gay white male narrative. You know, we're starting to get more yeah. LGBT. Yeah. And in, in all of our diversity, which is really important because it's not, you know, young people aren't just like gay, male, white kids. Yeah. So we need to have that diverse. That's sort of the next step, I think. And, you know, I'm trying to figure out how I can help participate in that and lift up other voices to tell those stories. 
As a writer, what makes a great screenplay? That, that thing that makes it special? I don't know, do you have the answers on those cards? No, because I, I could don't. use that, you don't <laughs> have the answers. All I can say is, is speak to like what best efforts can provide, right? You do your very best to do something that's very you mm -hmm. uh, and, and be, honest, be true to that. Make sure you're doing something that you really care about, that you think is very cool, that you um, have done your homework on, and then uh, do your best to make it the best it can be. Whether or not it hits, whether or not is, is really Sadly, it's very much not up to you. Mm. There are sometimes you can engineer it if you have the backing of a big studio or network and all the money in the world to market something. But for the most part, you're rolling the dice uh, a little bit as a creative person on stage and screen with how is that going to interact with the world when it comes out? Where's the world going to be? Mm. You know, what's in the zeitgeist at the moment? What's happening in the news? What have we all turned our attention to? I, I, I teach screenwriting and I mentor some people and I do say to folks, uh, trust your gut when you're thinking about what you're doing, uh, but trust your gut in two years from now. So trust your gut 2021, you know, 2022, where are we going to be? Because that's when your project is going to hit if everything goes flawlessly. Yeah. So don't be writing something for, for the now. news right now. Yeah. And so because it's, impo it's, a little, it's impossible to predict the future, I'm, my real advice is write what you love. Write what you know, because at least then uh, it's going to be, if you're really writing from your own experience or your own passion, uh, and you're getting really specific and trying to be really authentic about it and doing your very best, at least the project hopefully will turn out pretty well. Mm. You got a shot. Because if yeah. it turns out like crap, you have no shot. It doesn't matter how well-timed it is. Um, but, but at least you give yourself a shot. And the rest is luck. A little bit of luck. Let's talk a little bit about milk. Yeah. What was the process in developing the script? <coughs> and how did you manage to get it into the right hands? Because that's always what people want to know. How do you get mm. it in front of the right people? I mean, uh, milk was very unique at the time. And, and, and in fact, it's something I'm starting to look back on and, and do again. And it was unique in that uh, I didn't have a studio or a network, there were no financiers, there were no producers, there was nothing. It was just me and uh, the real people who had worked with Milk and, mm. and knew him, and a credit card. And it was a lot of buying people dinners and <laughs> drinks and convincing them to participate and believe in me uh, without pay. You know, at a certain point, <clears throat> there was a script. And I was in a fortunate enough position that I was writing on a you know, big hit HBO show. I had an agent. I had some access to like cast and, and, and had met some filmmakers uh, along the way. So I was fortunate in that way that I, I knew some people. You know, I was living in LA, which love it or hate it is helpful that's to be there. That's, the where it's, yeah, that's where it's all going on. I was able to get the script to Gus Van Sant because I had met Gus Van Sant. Um, we had a friend in common. We'd been at a dinner together years earlier, um, and I knew he had interest in the project. So I was able to get it to him, and thankfully he remembered me, and he responded to the script. When word leaked about that, uh, that we were now, I now had a director mm. on this project, I, I got a call, incoming call from uh, my friend Dan Jinks, who was a producer of American Beauty, and you know already. Sure won his Oscar and, and just as a congratulations and I just shared with him I said I don't have producers it's just me and, and he and Bruce Cohn who I still work with to this day stepped in to produce uh, and then and then it was this theory that I had that uh, that we had really um, that was hey this is not a no-brainer there at that time getting any sort of uh, LGBT story told was incredibly difficult Studios and networks were not interested um, uh, in, in lead characters who were LGBT or in storylines that were. Um, and so I, I, I thought what we ought to do is just make it undeniable. And that means get a crew together, get a cast together that says loud and clear to a studio, this could be profitable. This could attract an audience. Um, and, and so that's what we did. We built it, built it, built it and then took it to the one place we knew had figured out how to make money off of an LGBT-themed film. And that was the makers of Brokeback Mountain over mm, Focus yeah, Features. Sure. Yeah. And so we took it there because we, of, of all of the places in Hollywood, we thought they're gonna know how that this could make money. 
that, that there is a good business to be had here. And now, it seems silly to say that now. Now, we, you know, you look at the Oscars recently, and there's so many LGBT characters oh, yeah. and themes. It's wonderful. And, uh, and it's far like chalk more. and cheese. It's completely different to what it was back it's then. It's really yeah. changed. So by the time we got to Focus Features, it, we had Gus Van Sant directing uh, Dan Jinks and Bruce Cohen, uh, who had you know, just come off of American Beauty producing with me, and uh, Sean Penn, James Franco, and Emile Hirsch. I think that's who we had. But even then, it wasn't like a slam dunk. Mm. It was like, okay, let's proceed with caution and start stepping toward potentially making this. You've just recently written a memoir. Yeah. Which is coming out in two months' time? Yeah, April 30th. April? April. Yeah, and then I think it's like two weeks later in the UK. It's titled Mama's Boy. Yeah. I'm just intrigued. What made you want to write a memoir at this stage in your life? Yeah. And talk to me about the title. I, um... I, I was first approached to do a memoir twice before, after the Oscars and then after the Supreme Court went on marriage equality. Um, and both times I didn't know what it was about. I just thought, well, what is this just, you know, me patting myself on the back? Like, mm. I, I wouldn't want to read that. And then uh, something about the intersection of um, some things that happened in my family, uh, that happened in my life, uh, some great loss um, that tends to when you lose people who are really close to you you tend to start to see those relationships for what they are you understand how foundational they were you start to process them in a certain way and that intersected uh, with where the world seemed to be heading to me so you know long story short my family is mostly very conservative and looking through the lens this you know today's lens of should this relationship exist will this family uh, you know, stay together and stay close. The answer would, a lot of people would be like, no, gosh, that's going to be horrible. There's no cro there's no bridging that divide. And the truth is, is me and um, my mom are, were incredibly close mm. all the way to the end. We figured it out. Yeah. It was really tough, but we always figured out how to find the bridges and the connections, how to continue to communicate. I mean, sometimes it was heartbreaking, sometimes it was funny, sometimes it was absurd. Uh, but that's the kind of work you have to do to find that higher plane than politics. Yeah. That's what the book is about. How do we as uh, people in relationships, as families, and then as communities, find the bridges? How do you do it? What does it look like? Mm -hmm. What do the conversations mm -hmm. sound like? Um, it, can it be any fun? Is whiskey involved? The answer is yes. <laughs> uh, the, uh, Always. You know, <laughs> well, you know, there's like, there, there are just, there are things you have to do to remind yourself that life is so much bigger and better than just the headlines coming off of mm. the news programs. So, Mama's Boy <laughs> is, I mean, it, you know, I am a mama's boy, uh, but it also is, you know, it's, it's two people who a lot of people thought should have been divided yeah. and, and just didn't end up that way. Um, and, and, and so I'm hoping <laughs> that like a, like a pebble in a pond, mm our little story of our relationship and our family uh, might, might resonate with others and may bring a few more families or peoples and, mm. and communities together. together. That'd be great. If you could break the ice yeah. with anyone, yeah. past or present, who would it be and why? Anyone, uh, I mean, if, if, I could have, if I could have a drink with anyone, it would be my mom. Like to have her back and to... And that's not just because I miss, I mean, it is because I miss her, but it's also because I, unfortunately, I lost her before I had my own son. Mm. And my mom was paralyzed. Mm. And she raised three boys on her own. I mean, that's, all, that's in the book as well. And it's, uh, I just don't know how she did it. Mm. I have every limb working. I'm in great health. And it is a struggle, you know. It's a lovely struggle, but it's a lot of work. And I just don't know how my mom raised three boys without the use of her uh, legs and her body um, and I'm so curious yeah. and so and I just I want to know I have so much gratitude I need to share with her now and so many questions and I would love to ask and I would love her advice on a few things and it'll I'll get emotional thinking about it yeah. but that's that would be number one and number two you know right now it's all about what's in front of me right now for now um, and and right now I'm working on a Bayard Rustin movie um, and Bayard Rustin is another great hero of mine, uh, but you know he's 
if, if I could sit with him and interview him uh, for this project we're doing, that would be so incredibly helpful yeah. uh, and, it, and, and, and inspirational. And I also think he has a message of, uh, of collaboration and an understanding of intersectionality that we could really use right now in the world. And I'd like to get it right. And as much as I'm trying by asking everyone around, everyone who's still around who knew him, um, and reading his, his words, uh, it, there's n nothing compares to that firsthand conversation. So because that's in front of me, I think, you know, my mom and Bayard, which would be an awesome little, like, no. we'd have a nice, yeah. Drinks. We'd, have, have, we'd have some drinks. We could have some drinks. Yeah, we'd ask him to sing. He was, be, he was a great be. musician as well, but... Uh, yeah, I think that would be a great little yeah. trio. Can we do a trio? Can we do a Break the Ice yes, trio? Yes, of course. Right, yeah. Lance, cheers. Oh, cheers. Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much for, I just, yeah, I feel incredibly inspired. Oh, good. And uh, thank you for inviting us to your space and having us. Yeah, I'm sad you're going because now i got to get back to work. Yeah, okay. yeah. Go create some epic stuff. All right, well, yeah. come back anytime and distract me. I enjoy thank it. You. Yeah. Thank you.